Then we're going to open it up for your turn. Um, questions and answers for about a half hour. There are going to be microphones on either side. Uh, so when it comes time to questions for questions and answers, please just line up over there. You won't be in anyone's way as a result. Uh, then we're going to do a book signing afterward for anyone who wants to get a book signed. What we'll do is have it on the stage. So uh, just give us a little bit of time to reconfigure the stage uh, and, get, and get Richard situated so that he can sign your books. Also for tonight, if you become a member of CFI or RDF, uh, or if you're already a member, you'll get a photograph of Richard and he's happy to sign that as well. So I want, I want you to know that, that you're among friends here. You're among friends who are worried about what Tuesday has wrought, but we're, we're in this together, and it's only together that we will stand against some of the more pernicious promises that President-elect Trump has made. For instance, he's promised to overturn the Johnson Amendment, which bars tax-exempt institutions, including churches, from endorsing political candidates. He promised a $20 billion private school voucher program that will direct your tax money to indoctrinate children into religious beliefs. And his running mate, Mike Pence, our future vice president, stood on the floor of the US Congress in 2002 to denounce the theory of evolution <laughs> and promote the biblical account of creation. Boom. And we know we're going to face a hostile Supreme Court and a hostile Congress. But what I can promise you is that the Center for Inquiry and the Richard Dawkins Foundation will be in your corner. <laughs> we have a legal department, we have an Office of Public Policy, and they will be fighting for you. They will be <clears throat> representing secular, science-minded minded Americans in court and in Congress, and we will be on the ground organizing an activist response from, from our hundreds of student chapters, our communities, and our branches. So I know, I know there's a lot of, of shock and concern in this audience right now, we share it. But now is the time that we have to galvanize our movement. Now is the time to get involved, support a secular organization with your time and your money. Just as an aside, one of our benefactors, Lou Apignani, has put out a match of $250,000 for every dollar we raise up to that point between now and December 31st. Um, so we hope that you'll be generous at the end of the year to help us represent you. And in addition to that, we want you to contact your lawmakers. We want you to let them know that you are watching, you're holding them accountable. So please hear this, because I know this to my core. The future belongs to evidence-based thinkers and to people who hold enlightenment values dear. And to get to that future, we are not going to give up. We are going to get busy. So now, it's my great pleasure to offer an inspirational evening for you. CFI's own <clears throat> Point of Inquiry podcast host, Josh Zapps, and the brilliant scientist and thinker, Richard Dawkins.
it may not be clear that we are speaking two days after the US presidential election. So half of the people in this room are probably just looking forward to not thinking about politics for the first time in 48 hours. And half of you are probably thinking, why do I not have to think about politics for the first time in 48 hours? This is important. Um, I'm sure 100% of you would be interested in what one of the world's leading thinkers thinks about what the hell just happened. So before we ignore politics, Richard, what the hell just happened? <laughs> well. We just witnessed the wreck of the good ship democracy. And in Britain, we did it a bit earlier in the year as well. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. The world is moving into an ugly phase. But it has no xenophobia, there's no misogyny. Um, the motives are suspect to say the least. Um, I believe that in courts of law, judges can sometimes overrule the jury who've made an obviously perverse decision. And I wish something like that would happen now. But unfortunately, it can't. Um, we don't wish that such a thing would happen when the democracy goes our way, though, don't we? That's right. That's the problem with democracy. Yes. Uh, I mean, you've devoted your life to the pursuit of power and the promotion of reason, of science, of secularism, of rationality. And you alluded to Brexit, I think, in a similar vein to here, and you can look at movements like Le Pen in France or Alternative for Deutschland in Germany. Or Pauline Hanson in my own country of Australia. There are these movements that are deeply irrational. They're not based on facts. I mean, even even Trump himself or Trump supporters would not argue that that you're voting for a, for a particular set of policy judgments or policy actors. This is about the vibe of the guy. This is about sensation. This is about feeling. And I wonder what you make of that flow, whether you think that that sort of runs counter to everything that you've been trying to achieve. Well, it does. I mean, far, far from voting on factual evidence, uh, they have contempt for facts. And Trump clearly has contempt for facts. He lies and lies and lies all the time. Um, Brexit is a catastrophe. Um, it's, um, it, it remains to be seen whether, whether actually leaving the European Union is a, as much of a catastrophe as we, as we think it is. What's absolutely clear is that it was utterly unconstitutional for Cameron to call a referendum on a major constitutional uh, decision, uh, which is complicated, economically sophisticated, not the kind of thing that you should put to ordinary people. That's exactly the kind of thing that should be left to a representative democracy, where you elect members of parliament uh, to have a cabinet, which will look at all the options, all the ramifications, all the consequences, taking advice from civil servants, looking at all the, all the effects that will come. What we were given was a simple choice, leave or stay. The polls were going up and down like that. The vote just happened to coincide with a spike in the leave, uh, when, the, when the polls hit, hit leave. And we're now stuck with it for, well, for as, as good as ever, because it's an irreversible decision. The, um, the present situation in the United States is not quite irreversible uh, because the president has the power with the Republican Congress to appoint Supreme Court justices. Because Supreme Court justices don't have to um, retire at any particular age, um, we're probably in for a conservative, backward-looking Supreme Court for perhaps decades to come. It, it's a tragedy. Uh, and um, forgive me as a foreigner for saying so. <coughs> you say that the, the Brexit happened to pass because it, the poll happened to be taken at a point when the spike was up. I, I, I fear that that might be a little too generous to, to the, the populations who are in favour of, um, of these movements and that there's a fundamental anti-elitism which is motivating both Trumpism here and Brexit in, in the UK. Uh, and you say that this isn't based on facts, but obviously our duty is to try to correct misconceptions of fact whenever possible. And yeah. you know, to do so can often 
for you to put yourself precisely in the firing line of the very people who these people hate, which is you become an elitist because yeah. suddenly you're <laughs> wagging your finger at them and you're telling them that they're wrong yeah. about their beliefs. And you have been a, a target of this kind of thing for as long as I've been aware of you. Uh, people have accused you of being a snob, I suppose. So I wonder how you think one well, breaks through. I, I don't own the word snob. I'm, I'm actually quite happy to call myself an elitist. <laughs> That's good. I mean, it's been, the point's been made often enough that if you want to have an operation, you go to an elite surgeon, not some, somebody who's never held a scalpel in his life and just been elected. <laughs> well. And ditto when you fly on a plane, you want the pilot to have proper training to want him to have flown a plane sometime in his life before um, and to have some kind of qualification. Um, so yes, I'm an elitist when it comes to choosing a pilot to fly me, elitist when choosing a doctor to go to. Uh, what's wrong with elitism? I'm proud to be an elitist. <laughs> Last question that alludes to the election, and that is about the media and its role in all of this. Um, I wonder whether you think that the, the chase for ratings and the chase for clicks and followers and so on has sort of twisted the, the responsibility of the media. I worry about this and I worry about how we'll all get our information about the fact that obviously when we started out with the internet and social media, there was a sense that, oh, everyone's going to be able to, no one's going to be in a partisan anymore because we're all going to have access to this huge ocean of information. Yeah. Whereas what's actually happened is we've siloed ourselves into, into competing rival visions of the world. And I wonder if you... Yeah, I think you've said that very well. I mean, and the echo chamber effect is was being well, well recognized. Um, it probably is the case that if we were allowed to vote on the internet from our own homes using our own home computers, we'd go, have got a very different result. I think that part of the problem is that, unlike in Australia, where, where at least attendance in the polling booth is compulsory. Um, there's an awful lot of apathy both in Britain and America. A lot of people simply don't vote. And so it's possible that many of the people who uh, were polled and said they were going to vote for Mrs. Clinton actually just didn't bother to, to, to turn out. And if they, and if they hadn't, well, maybe not bother is not a fair way to put it. Maybe they were intimidated, maybe they were um, reluctant to spend hours waiting like waiting in a line to get into the polling booth. And so it's, it's arguable, I think rather plausible, that if, if voting were allowed from a home computer, obviously with, with safeguards, stripped of um, um, safeguards against being hacked and so on, um, that, that we, you, you, you might get a fairer result. How do we all get on the same page, though? Well, um, we don't know if we're getting all on, on the same page, but all I'm talking about is getting those, getting whatever page you're on, getting getting to the boat, getting to the polling booth. Mm. And it also is worth remembering, I think, that, um, as we lick our wounds, that, uh, that Trump did get a million fewer votes than Mitt Romney did. <laughs> Hillary Clinton just got five million fewer than Obama did last time. <clears throat> well, Hillary Clinton got more than Trump did this time. But that's true as well. <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> Um, part of what has, has motivated this, uh, this Trump backlash is his policy towards uh, Muslims coming into the country. Um, and this is something that I find myself deeply sort of conflicted about. Because it's, uh, on the one hand, uh, my father was a refugee from the war, and Australia welcomed me in, and um, I have nothing but gratitude for that, and I want to do the same. Um, on the other hand, there are practices and there are worldviews, illiberal worldviews, that are more predominant in some communities than others. If there's a community that is disproportionately homophobic and misogynistic, then it's legitimate, I suppose, to think about what proportion of that community you want to comprise your home culture. How do you grapple with yes, that? Yes, I think what is, and it's a sort of grossly liberal statement, that no Muslim is, you know, should, should be that this is a, this is a, a sweeping, um, and a rather obnoxious generalization. Um, Islam, the doctrine of Islam may be evil, but that, that definitely doesn't mean to say that individual Muslims are. And, and so, so it's a very important distinction to, to draw. 
Um, would you have any kind of um, reticence, I suppose, about the increase in the proportion of Muslim populations in Western countries, thinking about Europe in particular? I think I would probably, this may be an unfashionable thing to say, I think I might give favoritism to those apostates from Muslim countries who are under real threat because the penalty for apostasy in China. I wouldn't mind showing some favoritism there. <coughs> I don't know if you saw that the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a anti-discrimination um, organization in the United States, has released a list last week of anti-Muslim extremists. And on that list was Maya Hazali, Raja Nawaz, who was a former <coughs> extremist who is now reformed and runs uh, an outfit in the, in the UK, the William Foundation, specifically attacking Muslim extremism. And he is now being branded by an American anti-hate group, group <laughs> as an extremist himself because he's anti-extremist in extreme ways. Are we getting that model here? Martin Nawaz is a great hero, and so, of course, is I am myself. Um, um, I, I, I would like to think that they're being branded on this list is a matter of misinformation. In the case of Marjib Nawal, that's possible because he doesn't live in this country. In the case of Ayan Hazi it's probably because she has become associated in people's minds with right-wing think tank. Um, and the reason for that is that when she fled from Holland, they were the only people who would, who would look after her. But any criticism <coughs> of the doctrine of Islam is becoming interpreted by um, Western liberals as intolerance in itself. Exactly, and, I, and that's a, a, a very deplorable trend. What do we do? We talk, we write, um, we, we persuade, we use our, our powers of persuasion. Mm. Do you think that's better here than it is back in Europe? Um, well, there, there are fewer Muslims here, and those that there are are less militant. So um, we, we do have um, problems in Britain and in Europe of Muslim enclaves, which, um, in the case of Britain, there are regions of cities of Britain which are regarded as Muslim enclaves where the police will not go because um, they're, they're frightened. They're not frightened <coughs> of being killed. They're, they're frightened of being branded racist. Um, and so they will not go and intervene in so-called honor killings or uh, clitoridectomy, um, which goes on in Britain, does not go on in France. In, Fr in France, they've got laws in, in place which, which, which stops female genital mutilation. But in, in Britain, although there are laws against it, they're not enforced. People, the police turn a blind eye for fear of being, of being tarred with the, with the brush of racism as though Islam is a race. <laughs> One of the things that has dismayed me about the, the, the rise of, of anti-Islamic bigotry in the States is that it's made it more difficult to make reasoned, rational critiques of the doctrine of Islam without being lumped into the group and that's of precisely right. not just yeah. haters. Right. And I wonder if you have any thoughts or any advice for people who do care about this um, to create a more robust liberalism that's a genuine liberalism that is unashamed of, of I mean, you know, the ultimate minority is what is the minority of one. It is, as you say, the dissident in the Muslim country, not the, the, the misogynistic spokesperson for the Muslim well, community. Yes. How do we get through that? Yes. I'm not very helpful when people ask me what we should be doing. <laughs> I, 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 just, I just speak what I think is the truth. <laughs> and, it, and it doesn't always work. And, and, um, so. I, I don't have a recipe for how to persuade people. Um, I, I'm afraid I'm perhaps I just am too blunt. <laughs> well, also, also I, mean, I, I like to think I'm clear, and I have noticed that clarity is regarded as threatening. <laughs> there was a story out of Australia that I, I saw, I don't know if you caught it, about the the Burkini, yes. the, uh, 
a Muslim Australian uh, woman invented a burger with which she could, could go to the beach, and this was around the same time as cops in the south of France were arresting <laughs> Muslim women on the beach for wearing the niqab or the burqa on the beaches of Nice and, and so on. And, um, I saw a recent video about a young Muslim Australian ballerina who is proud of, of not doing the pas de deux with boys because she's not allowed to dance with boys under Islam. She's proud of wearing the veil while she's doing ballet. And this is being applauded as being something that's wonderfully empowering. <coughs> as if it weren't the case that that kind of Muslim dress is a reasonably recent uh, phenomenon which has been imposed by Saudi Arabia and Iran and the women of the Muslim world. Yeah. Walked through Afghanistan in the 1970s and not seen a Um, your thought, I suppose that's the end of a very long question, but your thoughts about that? Well, I'm, I'm not in favour of the French ban on the burqa, and I think that's an infringement of individual liberty. Um, so I don't, I don't think it should be against the law. Um, I think that, once again, persuasion, um, consciousness raising, even ridicule, I'm in favour of, but not, not actually. <laughs> Funding. Um, this is another one of the things Robin mentioned in her introduction about the possibility that we're going to have a, 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 an administration in the United States that's quite hostile to, to science. And um, quite apart from the fact that there are presumably all kinds of climate change studies that would have been done that won't be done, um, what, what's, your, what's your sort of sense of, about facing an administration? that is not going to have science on its side? Well, I'm worried about that, obviously, and I, I hear that um, Trump is perhaps planning to pull America out of the Paris agreements on, uh, on climate change, which would be very, very serious. Um, if he uh, appoints, uh, create, well, he's got a, a creationist vice president, and we're told that the vice president is going to play a very prominent role in as an advisor. If he appoints creationists to high up positions in the Department of Education, that would be terrible. Um, stem cell research, um, the, the fanatical anti-abortion lobby that he's listening to, um, I, I think it's very worrying. And I, I don't know, maybe just more sit it out for four years and hope for better things or, or um, it's possible I suppose that if you were to he, he does sound to be a man who doesn't really have many convictions of his own and so um, perhaps will listen to anybody who can get his ear um, if one could uh, somehow get influential scientists sensible scientists to get to him, they might be able to uh, persuade him to stop listening to people like, I don't know, Ben Carson or whoever, or, <laughs> or Mike Pence. Um, yeah, well, Pence doesn't even believe in evolution. That, that's right, and, and, and nor, nor does Ben Carson. Yeah. Um, as I discovered when I was on a platform with him once, I just couldn't believe my ears. <laughs> an apparently distinguished surgeon. Um, who, who thought you know, believed in Adam and Eve? Mm. How do people get to the education? <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? How do they compartmentalize or partition their brain to keep one little bit inured from the world of evidence? It is apparent that that can be done. <laughs> <laughs> trying to have creationism taught alongside evolution in public schools. Would you have believed it? No, uh, just as I wouldn't have believed it if you'd said that Donald Trump could possibly win an election. <laughs> <laughs> um, does it surprise you then that there hasn't been, I, I, I know that you've made the analogy occasionally to the gay rights movement, which is one of the most rapid, rapidly successful sort of changes of public consciousness towards uh, 
um, a, a social movement, I wonder whether or not um, you think that that's a good template to use for... Well, I do, yes. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a lesson in, in how successful one can be with consciousness raising. Um, but it hasn't taken very long, and it's a, it's a, it's a very spectacular and welcome revolution in, in our society. Um, and that's pretty much exactly what we're trying to emulate in the openly secular campaign, which I think Robin mentioned. Yeah. Um, I suppose that comes about through conversation, so I'm not going to ask you how we do that, because you just said we don't like doing it. But what are the levers of power in these sort of institutions that, are, that you most admire that are working towards that? Richard Dawkins Foundation, etc. Well, I don't know much about what's going on in, in America. I know about um, my own foundation and, and the CFI and the other um, secular organizations, all of which are doing good work. Um, but um, this is a country where, where opinion flows freely, where, where the internet flourishes, where um, we have a free press, and uh, there's uh, plenty of opportunities for people to exert influence. Um, and um, whatever it was that the gay community did, um, we need to do the same. Let's talk about science, let's talk about biology and evolution. Um, what attracted you when you were young, or when you were first trying to figure out a vocation to this one? You know, the funny thing is, I, I didn't really get properly turned on to it until my second year as an undergraduate at Oxford. And so obviously by then I must have decided, or I wouldn't have been reading biology at Oxford. So I, but it was pretty much a drifting. Um, so I think I'm just very lucky that my drifting process got me into a subject which was ready to grip me once I got to Oxford, and has gripped me for the rest of my, of my life. Um, and what, what it ended up attracting me when I was an undergraduate at Oxford was that it was a subject which you didn't just have to learn a lot of facts, of course I learned facts, but it was a subject where I was constantly, week after week, required to think required to write essays on controversial topics where I, need, where I had to read the opposing literature, in the, in, go to the library and read the opposing literature on a controversial question and then come to make my own mind up about it. And that's a wonderful experience for an 18, 19 year old. Not just read chapter 13 of the textbook and, and then take a test on it. This was go and study the controversy on the origin of the vertebrates and, and, and write an essay on, the, on it and make up your own mind about it. So that really captivated me, the chance of thinking for yourself. Uh, and um, so that's, so, but, but as I say, I, I kind of drifted into it in the first place. When you say that captivated you, was it the details, was it all the cool details that were captivating you? Or was it the sort of mind-expanding big picture. Yeah, it was the big picture. It was, it was the big picture. I, I, I recognize that um, in biology, in, in evolution especially, lay the answers to the really deep questions about life. What are we doing here? Why are we here? What's life all about? What's it for? Um, and the sort of questions, in fact, which, are, which traditionally religion had a monopoly on. And, uh, of course, physics is also good for that kind of question as well. But, but, um, uh, yeah, that, that was what. Yeah. I was going to say, a theologian would of course chuckle when you say that biology is the way that we answer the big questions about what are we here for, because um, they would say, well, you can't get from an is to an ought, and you can't get from the, the, the mere raw facts of, of evolution to a what our purpose in life is for that one needs, um, at the very least, philosophy and at the most, theology. Um, what's your answer to that? If anybody seriously think, thinks theology has an answer, to those sorts of questions. They just make it up. Not based on evidence at all. The thing that's attractive about science is it's based on evidence. Right, but they would say the things that they make up have been proven over the millennia to be ways of structuring society that provide us with guidance that is, um, that is worth following and that you're not going to get from studying DNA. There are all sorts of ways of structuring society. Anthropologists have studied hundreds of different cultures, all of whom have different ways of structuring society. And they're all different. They're all... Almost all of the religions. Yes, and they're all, all, all interesting. But, the, but the, the, they're almost all of the religious, but they're different. They don't believe in the same things. 
so they can be studied as anthropology, as a study of human culture, and that's interesting, I'm fascinated by that. But it doesn't get you to the actual answers to the question. The questions like, what is the sun, what is the moon? Every tribe has its own answer to that, which is wrong. <coughs> um, <laughs> we know what the right answer is. <laughs> Do you have a theory about, and if you've written a book about this as, as, as well, in which you go through the, uh, the traditional uh, explanations for these things and then reveal the actual scientific truth about, about these things. Um, and I wonder whether you think, do you, whether you have an explanation for the prevalence of religion throughout societies. Oh, yes, I think so. I mean, I think that, that uh, the, the, the human mind is naturally curious and naturally um, wants to know where, where we come from. Each tribe has its origin myth. Often it's an origin myth about where our tribe comes from. It's less interesting where all the other tribes come from. Um, and um, exactly how the origin myths arise, I don't know the answer to. I don't, I don't think many people do. Um, storytellers telling stories around the campfire and then gradually get it elaborated and augmented. Um, why are they so prevalent? Well, um, I think partly because children of a certain age, we, at a young age, are vulnerable to believing what their elders tell them. And so if they're told a story um, at the right age, they tend to believe it. And then when they grow up, they tell it to their children as well. So in, in each tribe has its own legends and myths which are passed down from generation to generation. And um, they get believed. This sounds a little bit like the social media siloing of thought that we were, <laughs> we were talking okay. about it's earlier. A bit like that, yes, but, but it's a bit different because, because that spreads sideways, whereas we're talking about longitudinal spread down through the generations. Yes. yes. Um, so once you've fallen in love with biology and you then go on to write a book that makes you internationally famous, The Selfish Gene. Was that a process of gradual evolution coming to the conclusions that were in that book? Or was there any sense in which it was something of an epiphany? Hmm. Um, around that time, uh, there was, around the 1960s, there was a number of popular books written by people like Conrad Lawrence, Robert Hartree, <laughs> Uh, which portrayed evolution in an erroneous way. They made out that natural selection works at the level of the group or species and ac accounted for the I'm a bit I invite you all to have a drink with me. To make my apology, as I've done on previous evenings, please forgive me if I croak. <laughs> well, it's because I've had a stroke. <laughs> Basal ganglion on the right makes me walk as if I'm tight. So if I sink to croaks and squawking, Josh will have to do the talking. <laughs> In the, in the 1960s, there were these books which accounted for things like altruism, cooperation, the, the way that aggression is ritualized and muted instead of being an all-out fight to the death, accounted for them with the idea that natural selection chooses between groups. And those groups in which individuals are altruistic or cooperative or don't fight to the death are more likely to survive than groups in which they are selfish and fight to the death. That's just wrong. Uh, and I wanted to write a book to put it right. Um, I mean, it wasn't my idea that it was wrong. It was wrong by the standards of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, which all biologists accept. Um, and so I fell to thinking about the right way to express it. About that time, 1964, a couple of very important papers were published by W.D. Hamilton, then a graduate student, University of London, uh, which, if, if, if read properly, gave the idea that the unit of supernatural selection is actually the gene. And things like altruism are best explained as, as are often best explained as a result of kinship. Um, 
animals who are kin, close kin, brothers and sisters, nephews and nieces, and so on, uh, are statistically likely to share genes. Therefore, a gene for <coughs> altruism is likely to be shared with brothers and nephews and nieces and sisters and things. And so altruism towards those close relatives will be favored by natural selection because the gene for it is actually carried in the body of the relative which is who is, who is, who is favored. So that led me to a sort of vision of natural selection at the level of the gene, and I, and I thought of the individual organism as a survival machine for the genes that ride inside it. So if an animal survives to reproduce, then the genes that helped it to survive get passed on to future generations. So as the generations go by, there's a kind of filtering, sieving process, whereby genes that are good at making bodies survive and reproduce are the ones that we see, are the ones that are there for the bodies that we see, are the ones that are built by it. Looking backwards, you can say that every individual alive is descended from a literally unbroken line of successful ancestors, every single one of whom survived childhood, and every single one of whom achieved at least one heterosexual copulation. That cannot be said of the majority of animals that have ever lived, but, but it can be said of those who did become ancestors. Ancestors are rare, descendants are common. Um, hmm. So I gave a course of lectures in Oxford in 1966, <coughs> which propounded this view uh, of the selfish gene. And then um, in the 1970s, I finally got a sabbatical leave at Oxford and decided to put it all down. In a, in a book. I'd actually forgotten that I had lecture notes from that early period, and I, and I found them again much more recently, and I was quite startled by the fact that in 1966, the, the central rhetoric of the selfish gene, that's say 10 years earlier than the book, the central rhetoric of the selfish gene was already there in my lecture notes, the idea of in, immortal genes skipping like chamois down the generations, that kind of stuff. Um, so that, that, that answer question. Mm. I, I, you reminded me there of a, a metaphor that you have, which is to imagine a, a picture book which you can flip through to create a little cartoon sort of thing, in which there's a photo of me, and then a photo of my mother, and a photo of her mother, yeah. her mother, and her mother. Yes. Going back. Can you just tell us that, explain well, that metaphor? Um, it, this, is a, this is a way of. Um, of partly expressing the great span of time. Um, only that if you have all these photos stacked on top of each other, um, how, how far, how, how, how big a stack of photos would you have to, to, to make in order to get back to, shall we say, Lucy three, three million years ago, or shall we say, um, your fish ancestors um, in the Devonian <laughs> period? And the answer, of course, is that the stack of photographs would be beyond imagining. Would be, um, I think you'd have to, um, I think to get back to, to Lucy, you've got, a, you've got a pile of photos that would be the height of the Empire State Building or something like that, and then um, you get back to the fish, it would be, um, you'd have to put them in a, in a bookshelf and it would stretch from up I mean, 40 miles or something, I forget which is that, that, that deep details. But I also use this metaphor to make the important point that although we are descended from fish, there was never a moment when there was a sudden transition. Every one of these photos, as you go along this 40 mile long shelf, starting with yourself, then your mother, then your grandmother, and so on, every one of them is almost exactly the same as, the, as its neighbors in the, in the series. Every, every animal ever born was a member of the same species as its parents and its children. And yet, if you, if you stack enough of them and then together, you get back to a fish. There never was a moment when, say, a pair of Homo erectus parents looked lovingly into some Pliocene cradle <laughs> that we'd given birth to the first Homo sapiens. <laughs> it, it was never like that. There never was a first Homo sapiens. This is one of the most difficult things for people to, to grasp. 
they sort of think, well, there must have been a first human, must have been. No, there wasn't, because the first human had parents and grandparents, and they had parents and they had parents. Gradually, 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 as you walk along the line, you will, you will, see, you will see change. But the change is so slow, so gradual, that you have to walk miles along the line before you really notice it. But eventually, if you walk far enough, you'll come to a fish. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful to just imagine the, the family picture book? <laughs> right on the very last page, there's a fish, and it's actually your your uh, your ancestor. These kinds of, of things excite me so much, and I think are so obviously appealing and obviously interesting when you conduct these thought experiments and when one reads your your books. That there's a certain infectiousness about them, and religious people are prone to say that science is drab and dreary and bereft of meaning. Preposterous! <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand their worldview? I pity them. <laughs> their worldview is so impoverished, so petty, so small so lacking in any kind of grandeur or poetry or, even, or, or indeed truth. Um, so yes, I, mean, I, I have nothing but, but pity for that kind of small-minded, petty-minded <coughs> lack of vision. I've, I've mentioned to you before that my favorite book of yours is Unweaving the Rainbow, which is this uh, sort of um, poetic homage to the, to the majesty of science and the poetry of science. And um, it, it's always intriguing to me that I was not a scientific kid because whatever it was about the educational system that I grew up in did not inspire me with science until I was in my teens and I started reading you and Sagan and Feynman. And um, I wonder whether or not you think that we ought to rethink how we teach science as a yes, it's, it's interesting. Um, there is a school of thought in teaching science that it has to be practical, and I, I, I sort of get that in a way. It's, it, it's important that we should have practical skills in science, and we should have scientists who can do science, and so learning how to use a Bunsen burner is important. But it's not exactly inspiring. <laughs> and, um, I, I'm glad you mentioned Carl Sagan because I, I would contrast the Bunsen Burner School of Science Teaching with the Carl Sagan School, where what you do is you inspire, you encourage the young people to look up the stars and stretch their imaginations um, and listen to some of Carl Sagan's beautiful poetic writing and, and speaking in, 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 for example, in the Cosmos series or the, the famous pale blue dot um, monologue. Um, I think actually that's the way to inspire people in, in science. Um, I, I've got a, a book, I, fortunately, I can't remember, unfortunately, I can't remember the author, but it, it's got a lovely uh, thought experiment which, it, which encourages the children to, uh, to visualize the scale of the universe in the following way. Going to, go to the playing field in the school, with a soccer ball and put the soccer ball in the middle of the field and that represents the sun. And then to scale, you need to walk, I forget what it is, maybe 20 yards um, and put down a, probably a peppercorn to represent Earth. And then an inch away from, from Earth, you put a pinhead to represent the moon. And then, I don't know, 100 yards away, you walk a bit further and you put a, a ping pong ball, I may have got the details wrong, to represent, uh, let's say, Saturn. Um, and having got to sort of to the, towards the edge of the solar system, then where is the next star, the nearest star, Proxima Centauri? Pick up another soccer ball and walk 2,000 miles. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nearest star. We haven't even started to get towards the edge of the galaxy, let alone the next galaxy, a 
let alone a distant galaxy. Um, well, I think that's the kind of, I've actually done that with children from time to time. And they love it. 2,000 miles. <laughs> <laughs> it must be bored by the end of it, Richard. <laughs> you need to take a packed lunch. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think we got as far as the next field. <laughs> but, but that really did turn them on. And, and, um, and I think that, that, that's, the, that's the right approach. And, and not that you don't actually need to do science in order to appreciate it. Mm. And I think a good analogy there is music. Um, you can become, you can love music, and even become an expert on music, like Bernard Shaw, without actually being able to play a note on any instrument. And so it's possible that, that Forcing children to do five-finger exercises on a piano is not the best way to instill a love of music. Um, and similarly with science, you don't actually need to, to, to do scientific experiments, although it's a good thing to do, in order to appreciate science as a kind of aesthetic pursuit. Separately to that, or parallel to that, I think it's important to, to teach the scientific method of thinking, the critical, the critical thinking that's, that goes with science. Um, and um, so I will teach those two things. Does that come back to our conversation about the media earlier as well? Because one sort of hobby horse in mind is that people don't know how to consume information. They don't know how to rationally evaluate the media that they're being fed and what, what is credible and what is not credible. Uh, I wonder yeah. whether there's a parallel there. Yes, I mean, I think it's, it's very important to, to try to instill a, a sceptical attitude and, and, and an evidence-based attitude, an attitude of trying to question what's the evidence for that? Um, how do you know? Um, is, uh, I think statistical thinking is important as well, not, not to be fooled by small numbers or even just single anecdotes into thinking that that's a general trend. So I would like to see logic and statistics taught at, at schools as well as the present subjects. And, and when you mention scepticism, there's a tricky um, misunderstanding here, I, I think. Um, we in the sort of broadly skeptic community who believe in skepticism as a way of approaching the world, and a way of approaching data, will often get frustrated because being skeptical about things is often used by deeply gullible people to justify their cynicism about facts. Yes. You often get into arguments with people who believe some vast conspiracy about the Clintons or something, or who will be totally gullible about something that Donald Trump said. Sorry, you get political, it's just at the top of my head at the moment. And they think that they're being skeptical. They think that their belief that 9-11 was an inside job is evidence of critical thinking. And that we're the gullible ones. Yeah. Well, I think, as I say, logic and statistics and, and um, evaluation of what's plausible, I suppose, as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, one, of the, one of the branches of, of CFI, the Centre for Inquiry, um, it, it, it is the, um, the CSI, which investigates things like homeopathy and conspiracy theories and flying saucers and um, uh, dowsing and that, that kind of thing. Mm. The, the double-blind control experiment is a very good teaching tool. <coughs> yeah, yeah, as you know, it's much used in medicine. Yes. Um, when you're trying to evaluate whether a particular drug, say, is effective. And so you have the dose, the experimental dose, and you have the control dose, which is, which has a, is a pill or say a pill that looks just the same as the experimental one. The important thing is that when you compare, when you say give this patient the experimental and that patient the control, mm -hmm. that neither the patient nor the nurse who gives the pill nor the doctor who evaluates them, um, nobody knows which is which of these pills. The, the, the data is coded with numbers, and the numbers are Close, closely guarded, perhaps in a computer, and only at the end of the experiment, when the experiment is completed, do you actually unlock the numbers and reveal which patient had the experiment or which patient had the control. Now that's a very, very important technique in medicine. And it's a very important teaching tool as well, I think, because if you understand why that's important, you realize um, how easy it is to be biased. A, a, a doctor with the best will in the world is likely to be biased one way or the other, in, either in favor of the dose, or, the, or, or he may want it to, to succeed or, or not. He may be ultra-conscientious and be biased against 
the, the theory he's trying to, to establish. Um, and so a, avoidance of confirmation bias. It's the double-blind control experiment is a beautiful teaching tool for, for getting that across. In a very simple example, when I was um, married to my first wife, Marion, we did a double-blind control, it wasn't quite double-blind, it was single-blind, test on uh, razor blades. So um, this is a sort of fun little, little exercise. Um, I, I was shaving with either Gillette or Wilkinson blades, <laughs> and um, so I, di I didn't know which, which I was shaving with. She, she put the, put the, the blade in for, into, into the razor for me. And then when I, got, when I thought it was getting too blunt to use, I would say, okay, this one's finished. And she would note down how long I had been shaving with this, with this one. Um, and then at the end, um, she did the analysis. So it was, it, she, it, to be fair, she, she, she knew which blade was, was which, and so it's possible she could have influenced me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she had shares in Wilkinson. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, that, it did in fact produce a positive result. And Wilkinson blades were significantly better. <laughs> <laughs> if they want to sponsor a point of inquiry, then I feel they offer. Um, you've been. This is the sixth event that you've been doing in the United States on this particular tour. Um, so I'm not the first person to, to be on this rodeo with you, and I wonder whether or not, because it's your final night in the United States on this tour, there's any question that has not been asked of you, which you would like to have been asked. That's an easy, easy way for me to, for so me to it, do my job. It, it's true that I'm rather used to being asked the same question again, but, but in, in your case you actually asked a lot of different questions. Good. It's rather gratifying. Um, one that I haven't been asked. Um, well, I haven't been asked um, why it took so long for for Darwin to come on the scene. Why did it wait <coughs> till 1850, the 1850s? Um, in the history of Western thought. In the history of Western thought. All right, because Richard, <laughs> I have a question for you. In the history of Western thought, why did it take so long for Darwin to come along? Well, um, first, it, Darwin actually had the idea a, a, a bit earlier, and he, he actually wrote unpublished manuscripts in, 18, in the early 1840s, 1842 and 1844, I think. Um, and then he sat on it for an, until 1858, when Wallace independently thought of it and sent a, a paper to Darwin, which, as you know, sent Darwin into a sort of panic. Um, and uh, the, the, the resolve by Darwin and Wallace presenting papers in, in their absence simultaneously to the Linnean Mayor Society. And then Darwin wrote the book the year after 1859, which was the one that actually um, hit Victorians uh, because it was a, a, a beautifully argued book. Darwin called it one long, long argument. Um, there was a man called Patrick Matthew, who in 1831, I think, um, published a book on naval timber in which, in the appendix to his book on naval timber, he outlined a sort of version of the theory of natural selection. Um, understandably enough, Darwin overlooked this. Um, books on naval timber were not part of his <laughs> Patrick Matthew was very indignant about this and, and wrote to Darwin to complain, and Darwin punctiliously acknowledged Patrick Matthew in the second edition of what well, in subsequent traditions of the origin of species. Um, so, um, it, but what, who, whoever did think of it first, it was somebody in the mid 19th century. Why not earlier? Why, why did it wait 200 years after Newton, <coughs> whose ideas were so much cleverer, I think, I mean, so much more difficult to, to understand? Why do you say that? Well, because. <coughs> Well, you don't need any mathematics to understand Darwin for a start. Um, Newton actually had to invent a major branch of mathematics, namely calculus, in order to do his great work. Um, but the idea of natural selection, even to my natural selection, is supremely powerful and supremely simple. 
if you measure the power of an idea, power of a theory, as a ratio with the numerator above the line being that which it explains, and the denominator below the line, that which it needs to postulate in order to do the explaining. The, the, Darwin, the Darwinian ratio is gigantic. It explains everything about life. The diversity of life, the complexity of life, the beauty of life, the illusion of design, profound illusion of design of life. What it needs to explain it is desperately simple. It's more or less just it's, it's, it's non-random survival of random hereditary codes. Um, that seems to me to be a, a good example of something which a philosopher might have thought of from the depths of an armchair. It's that simple. Yet it wasn't thought of until the 19th century. And it was thought of by two traveling naturalists with enormous knowledge of natural history, enormous knowledge of natural history, in Darwin's case, South America and, um, and Australia and Black Islands and so on. In Wallace's case, South America and the East Indies. Um, so it seems as though encyclopedic knowledge of nature was important. And yet the idea is so simple that I don't understand why Aristotle didn't get it, why Hume didn't get it. Um, why did no philosopher get it? It seems to me that philosophy let us down. I mean, what actually is the use of philosophy? It can't be something so <laughs> evolution by natural selection. Um, well, why did it take so long? Uh, Ernst Meyer, one of the great um, founders of the modern synthesis of evolution theory, he blamed it on essentialism, sort of the idea of Plato, um, uh, which comes from sort of Greek geometers who were interested in perfect circles and perfect triangles and perfect rhombuses and trapeziums and ellipses and things. Um, so if you, if you believe, as Plato did, that um, real circles are, are um, imperfect approximations to a kind of ideal circle, sort of hanging out there in imaginary space, um, Maya thought that Plato and Aristotle were hampered by a similar essentialist view of life. And so they thought that the real <coughs> pigs, or real rats, or real kangaroos, were imperfect approximations to an ideal pig, or rat, or kangaroo. Um, and the leap that was required, which Darwin and Wallace took, was to realize that there's no such thing as an ideal pig, or rat, or kangaroo. There's a constantly changing pig. A pig can turn into something else, a rat can turn into something else. Um, and that was the barrier that, according to Maya, had to be broken. And that was why Aristotle and Plato couldn't get it. They were stuck on essentialist idealism. Um, that's a possible idea. It's, it's reasonably plausible, I think. Um, I wonder, too, perhaps, whether it was the very... I, I've said it was the most uh, uh, extremely powerful idea. The, the, the ratio of that which it explains over that which it needs to postulate is so high. Maybe that was the problem. Maybe it, it's so powerful that it, it wouldn't have occurred to anybody that it could possibly have a simple solution. The problem of life seemed to be so complicated that it must have seemed obvious to everybody that it had to have a designer. The idea that it could, that something so complicated as life, something so beautiful as life, and so manifestly designed as life, could have come about by slow, gradual, natural forces, just atoms bumping into each other. Uh, that is such an implausible idea that maybe it did have to wait a, a tremendously long time before anybody thought of it. Now we know it, now Darwin has given it, Darwin and Wallace has given it to us. We think it's desperately simple. God was a bad explanation, but he, he left it open for future generations to discover what the right explanation was. And I'm sure he would have been absolutely riveted if, he, if, if Darwin had been born in time to, to tell him about it.
as I hear you speculate about that, I wonder whether or not the reason why it took so long to, to come across evolution as an idea might also not have something to do with how difficult it is to imagine the spans of big time Good point, that yes. it would take. Yes. It's just inconceivable for yes. an armadillo to turn into something completely yeah. different. Yes, you, unless you appreciate it. That's right. Deep, 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 deep time is, 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 is hard to grasp. And you, you meet this today when people say things, things like, well, well, I'll believe in evolution when I see a monkey give birth to a human. <laughs> Your mother did. <laughs>
over the centuries, but it's, this is still the best time to be alive. Um, uh, and in many respects it is. And um, so they are optimistic, they think that's going to go on. Um, I don't know where I stand in that. I, I have my moments of optimism, like Matt Ridley, and my moments of pessimism, like uh, Martin Rees. Um, and uh, so I you know I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle. Do you think at the very least they will vanquish religion? Eventually, but it'll, it'll take a long time. It's, it's, we're, we're moving in the right direction in, in Europe and in America. Um, America is lagging behind for reasons I don't understand, but mm. it's moving in the right direction. And a number of people who profess no religion is now about 20%, which is as high as any particular religion. Mm. Uh, so I, I get great, great, great comfort from that. And in parts of Europe, religion is almost completely dead, except for Islam, um, which is which has been sticking up like a sore thumb exception. And, um, very worrying. Mm -hmm. But that's due to my great opinion. Yes, yeah. uh, thank you. 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 So if you, uh, if you want to get in, get in. Now, and, uh, as always, I know everyone encourages one to keep the questions tight, but uh, if possible, keep questions tight. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I have so many questions that I'd like to ask. One that I think uh, I'm most amused by is, um, you know, looking as an evolutionary biologist and looking in the world, back in the past and how we got to where we are right now. Uh, can you offer any comments or insight on maybe where we're going? Uh, you know, we're talking about you know, issues of climate change and the evolutionary principles that led to us being homo sapien presumably could also lead to us being some future generation of ourselves. Um, have you ever given that a thought? Well, you have to remember that um, the, the time scale which, which you need in order to get a, a, an actual... I'm going to put it on my tire here because it's on my left lateral. Maybe that's better. Um, the, the, the time scale that um, when you look back in the past and you say look back to Lucy three million years ago uh, who was walked on her hind legs but had, the, had a brain the size of a chimpanzee. Um, and um, the, so the, the, a major trend since Lucy's time has been the, the inflation of the brain. Our brains are hugely bigger than in Lucy's time. If you're asking the kind of question, is that trend likely to continue three million years into the future, um, that would only be true if uh, that if the people with the, let, let, let's suppose that we use the word brainy for having a big, a big brain, would only be true if the brainiest individuals among us consistently uh, had more children than the less brainy individuals mm. among us. In the last election proved that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, and, and you'd have to make that kind of argument for any kind of major morphological change by getting you longer legs or, or longer arms or something yeah, like that. I'm, I'm, I'm certain, uh, certainly aware of the time, the time that we have to talk, but uh, I just mean you're sort of like a tolerance to heat and environmental temperatures. Yes, and, uh, there, there might be something like that, but even there, remember that it, it would only work if your tolerance to heat, etc., affected your ability to survive long enough to reproduce. Uh, and with our sort of feather-bedded medical uh, environment, that may be changing, by the way, um, the, it, it becomes rather, rather difficult to die young. Um, and so, um, in, in, at least in the sort of civilization where it is difficult to, to, to die young, the ability to survive becomes less important than the, ability to, than the tendency to reproduce once you have survived. 
Um, so that there, no doubt there, there is natural selection going on. I mean, in, in certain co communities, certain parts of the world, for example, there are um, there are genetic there's genetic immunity to AIDS, for example, which is probably exerting natural selection effects in parts of Africa where um, where AIDS is rife. Um, so that there is that kind of natural selection. Okay. Yes, this question's for Richard Dawkins. Does oh, the... <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> does the concept of panspermia, uh, does it give, or since there is only one tree of life, for what we understand, uh, if there was only one tree of life, does that give credence to the idea of panspermia, that life was seeded rather okay, than... Pan evolved? Panspermia is the, is the idea that life didn't originate on our planet, but came here from, from outside. Um, one version of it is the sort of Fred Hoyle version, which is that something like spores, or bacterial spores, say, drifted through space and arrived here. Uh, there's a more radical version called directed panspermia, which started with a Swede called Arrhenius and was adopted semi-facetiously, I think, by the great Francis Crick and Leslie Orwell, uh, which is the idea that a, an advanced civilization somewhere in the galaxy um, sent a rocket, some, some means of propulsion, in, with a deliberate intention of seeding a planet with bacterial life. That's, that's directed panspermia. Um, I don't see the need for either kind of panspermia um, because I don't think it's that implausible that life arose uh, on this planet, de novo. Um, but and, and certainly Fred Hoyle and, uh, and Francis Crick, to a lesser extent, do um, preface their ideas by the suggestion that it is the, the, the origin of life on this planet could have been a very improbable event. Um, but no, it is a, it, it, you can't be sure that panspermia isn't true, uh, but I, I don't think there's any, any particular need for it. As reluctant as I am to uh, offer another question or originating in politics, um, I think I find that this one radiates a little more than that. Um, in one of the debates, Trump was asked whether, what would his stance to be uh, towards uh, fixing the problem of Islamophobia. And uh, I don't remember the specific garbage that came out of his mouth, but uh, more or less, uh, do you... M my personal view is much in line with that of Sam Harris in that if when you look at uh, religion like Islam, much of the problems that originate from it are from its doctrine and that it is inherently more violent than other religions and I think that's why we see you know, it being more problem in today's society. But compared to other religions such as Christianity, when you look at reforms such as the New Testament, um, do you think that it's too late for Islam to witness a reform such as the New Testament compared to Christianity? Well, I mean, th this is one of the things that uh, Majid Nawaz and Ayan al are trying to do, is to, is to, is to reform is Islam. I, I don't like the word Islamophobia, I think it's an invented word, um, which is much overused and misused. Um, what I'm phobic about is beheading people, uh, killing, pe killing apostates, cutting off the clitorises of small girls, um, setting young women on fire because of, that they want to marry somebody who's not their cousin. Um, this, this, uh, that's what I'm phobic about. If you want to call that Islamophobia, you can do so. Um, so I don't think the word is, is, a, is, a, is a useful one. Um, and I agree with you that um, although most religions, if not all religions, have evil aspects to them, some are worse than others, you can't say they're all equally bad. And um, I think you'd have to look hard to find one that was worse than Islam. Right now or always? Oh, well, in the past, Christianity was just as bad, but, 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 um, but we're talking about now. Uh, and and, and those, those people who say, oh, well, Christianity is just as bad. Look at the witch hunts of Salem and look at the, look at the crusades and things. That was a long time ago. It <laughs> makes a difference. Yes, I often say, well, if I was alive during the crusades, I would be criticizing Christianity. Yeah. Have I made yeah, any sure. one piece of that? Uh, I, sorry, no, we just can't have follow-ups because all, we've got to get as many people as we can. Thank you. Um, Professor Dawkins, thank you for coming to speak to us. 
Uh, in one of your lectures, you referred to the inherent likability of animals. I thought that was a great phrase. Uh, what is the most amazing animal you have studied and had the opportunity to explore? <coughs> well, I haven't actually studied all that many of them, but, but the one, perhaps the no. Okay, how about Verosifaca? Um, this is a lemur, um, which lives like all lemurs in Madagascar, and it dances on its hind legs. And uh, so it, it, it lives in trees and needs to cross clearings to get from one forest to another. And it does it on its hind legs, and it's in a beautiful kind of bounding gait on two legs with its arms up in the air. Uh, Google it, it's well worth it. <laughs> Hi. Uh, good evening, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, my question for you is, now that Trump's won the election, using rather unusual political methods. Do you think the idea of political correctness in America is changing, and do you think it's a good thing? Like many people, I'm rather fed up with political correctness. I'm rather, I'm rather fed up with the phrase, actually. It's, it's, it's an overused phrase, and, and, it's, and it's overdone. I think the phrase refers to is overdone. Um, Trump's, um, the sheer viciousness of his rhetoric, I found beyond belief. Um, and um, so, uh, although I've long been a bit of a foe of what is called the political correctness movement, if anything, Trump drove me back to want to be a bit more politically correct. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think there's a conflation there about two different kinds of political correctness? You know, that on the one hand, we can be a bit fed up with people on college campuses you know, uninviting Ayan Percy Ali from speaking. Or me, for that matter. Or, you know, have you been uninvited? Are you an Islamophobe? I was, I was uninvited, and then, and then three weeks later, I was, with an apology, re-invited again. So I think it's worth noting that there's a difference between that and Trump saying that, it, that political correctness is the reason why he can't say that all Mexicans are rapists. Of course, that, of course. I mean, that, that, that's really what I want. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Go for it. Good evening, and thank you for brightening ours. Uh, stateside, we now have a government sympathetic towards at least two of the Abrahamic faiths. Considering monotheistic superstition has varying degrees of influence from Algeria to Afghanistan, and the treatment of women, the harassment of homosexuals, the persecution of apostates, and the prosecution of blasphemers, how can we best proliferate dialectic, freedom of expression, and freedom of inquiry in today's political, cl political climate? And how important do you believe it is to address the faithful here so that we can better help our brothers and sisters around the world who don't have a say in the matter? Yeah, I never know when I'm asked how you should do things in, in society. I'm just not a politician. And I, um, I, obviously, I want to influence people. <coughs> I don't seem very good at it. I mean, I can... I, can <laughs> I, I think I'm reasonably good at teaching people science. Um, but I don't think I'm terribly good at mobilizing people into, into political factions who will actually achieve anything. Um, and I just Do dispute that? I dispute that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can't really suggest anything other than talk sense, but that doesn't seem to work. <laughs> Hi Richard, uh, thanks for doing your Christmas lectures, uh, it inspired me as a kid. But, um, so I hear uh, conflicting reports of this, there's the most uh, largest amount of species on Earth than there ever have been, maybe due to man uh, trying to protect them, more trees than we thought and more than ever. Um, and then I also hear that, that we're in the sixth grade extinction. Can you give us some insight on what your opinion or if you have data? Um, do we have a lot of animals compared to before or not as much? Thank you. Well, I think, I think we are. I mean, there seems to be little doubt that we are driving animals and plants extinct at a, at a great rate. I think it's tragic. Um, and I'd like to do something about it. Um, that's a almost an aesthetic judgment. I mean, I, I, I feel <coughs> an emotional bond to animals and plants and living things generally, and I don't like to see them go extinct. Um, and so I, 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 I will sign petitions and join marches and things to try to stop the destruction of the Amazon rainforest and, and stop, you know, um, 
doing things which are, which are destroying the, the environment. Above all, of course, um, uh, climate change, which is, which is, which is destroying um, all sorts of areas, including the Arctic. Good evening. Um, early in the dis discussion, you spoke about the elite, um, and you spoke about Brexit, and maybe that was a decision that should have been left to the political elite in England. Back in July, in America, we had nominations for president, and when the polling was high for Bernie Sanders, the political elite basically said, we want our elite up there. How do you explain, or how do you make the populace trust the elite when they sometimes ignore the data um, yeah. that's presented to them. When I said I was an elitist, <laughs> I, 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 I sympathize entirely with where you're coming from and, and I would like to see the political system changed in such a way that it, that, that kind of thing did, would not happen. Um, when I said I was in favour of an elite, I meant a genuine elite. I didn't mean the people who just happened to have risen to the top of the political tree. Um, I meant, when I used the analogy, when I used the analogy of an elite surgeon who knows how to do an operation or an elite pilot who knows how to fly a plane, um, I'm talking about people who really know what they're talking about, really know what they're, what they're doing. They are experts in something. One of the political leaders of the Leave Europe campaign in Britain, Michael Gove, actually made a speech in which he encouraged people to mistrust experts. Now, I don't want to mistrust experts. I might say mistrust existing leaders, elite in that sense, but I would never say mis mistrust experts. Good evening. Morality has evolved greatly over the past several years. Um, I think we can all agree that there are certain things that certain cultures do that are very moral. Uh, but if we believe that morality is subjective, how do we justify telling those other cultures that what they're doing is immoral? Yes, a very difficult question. Um, Sam Harris has written a very interesting, controversial book called The Moral Landscape, in which he tries to argue against the conventional wisdom that science has nothing to say about what's right or wrong. Um, and he argues that there are certain things which it would be perverse to deny are immoral, like the infliction of pain, say. Uh, and he argues that science can help to establish what, what is painful. Um, and uh, and I, I'm, sort of, I'm drawn to that. I'm, hitherto, I was very much in your camp of saying that you know, there's nothing we can say. That, that all, all we can do is a kind of moral philosophy which says, if you think such, such and such is right, then you're inconsistent if you think that so-and-so is wrong. Um, but fundamentally, you have to rely upon uh, a sort of intuitive axiom as to what you think is right or wrong. And, and, for, and for that, you could argue that each culture has its own standards and you can't, you can't argue against it. Um, I, um, can I recommend a, a, a rather radical paper that was written by my colleague Nicholas Humphrey, it was actually a, a lecture called What Shall We Tell the Children? I think if you Google Humphrey, not, not Humphreys, but Humphrey, Nic Nicholas Humphrey, and What Shall We Tell the Children? Um, he takes an extremely radical stance about this. He discusses the Amish, and he discusses um, a particular instance of a cultural murder which was sanctioned by the cultural concern, namely the um, religious sacrifice of the so-called Ice Maiden by the Incas in Peru uh, some centuries ago. And he talks about a television documentary that was shown in Britain in which the story of the Ice Maiden being taken on a bullock cart up the mountain to have her heart torn out and sacrificed to the sun god. The television documentary, by his account, extolled the cultural values of the people and speculated that this young woman would have been overjoyed at having been selected for the privilege of being sacrificed for the god, um, which is the sort of extreme cultural relativism position. Humphrey says, 
How dare you, how dare you suggest that this poor girl um, was actually pleased at the idea of being, <clears throat> of being sacrificed. So he takes it, and I'm kind of telling you the story, that you make up your mind, go read it. Um, I think I veer towards the Nick Humphrey or Sam Harris view that it becomes positively perverse to bend over backwards so far towards appreciating separate cultural values that you, that you approve of things like female genital mutilation or sacrificing somebody to a sun god. Early, early you spoke of how slow evolutionary change is and how continuous. And that got me wondering, when we assign a uh, species in a given lineage, is that simply an arbitrary or an artifact of an incomplete fossil record? Yes, uh, that's an interesting point. Um, it, the, the fact that we can do that is, is um, a sort of artifact of the, of, of the fact that we're seeing only contemporary animals. We don't see the fossils. They, they, they're not alive still. If they were, if, say, there was, um, if, if nothing ever went extinct, uh, if, say, there were there's a complete series of um, our ancestors, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Australopithecus, various species, um, Articithecus, um, whatever we go back to, the common ancestor with chimpanzees, and then a similar continuum from that common ancestor to modern chimpanzees, such that there would be a gradual continuum between ourselves and chimpanzees. So we couldn't actually have fertile matings with chimpanzees, but we could have a fertile mating with this one, we would have a fertile mating with that one, we could have a fertile mating with that one, and so on, in an unbroken chain to modern chimpanzees. Um, that would make a nonsense of all attempts to um, make rigid separation between species. We can, and by the way, in, in order to, in, to enact our various um, laws whereby you can, you're not allowed to enslave humans, but you can put chimpanzees in cages in zoos. Uh, you'd have to have, in order to justify that, you'd have to have sort of apartheid-like courts, like in South Africa, to decide whether this individual counts as human or not, that sort of thing. Um, so perhaps it's fortunate that we don't have all those intermediates. We are enabled to, to make these discriminations. It's not fortunate for the chimpanzee. No, it's not. That's right. Um, so given that we only have living animals, we don't have the, the ancestors, um, we can make a, a moderately rigid criterion which works much of the time, which is that if you can interbreed with uh, another animal, then if, if two animals can interbreed, then they're, then they're the same species. Um, and uh, obviously that there's an intermediate stage when they can interbreed, but not very well, not very reliably, and then they're halfway to becoming separate species. Um, but yes, you're, you're right. And there, there is a sense in which our ability to classify animals into distinct species is an artifact of the extinction of the dead intermediates. Um, can I just first express my great gratitude for you coming here? You have to be one of the, the, the top uh, educators in my pantheon of appreciation uh, concerning uh, evolution, biology, and just general philosophy itself. And I, I actually want to call upon a commentary uh, that will include Zeph as well, because I'm very appreciative that you have come out. Um, the, the one thing that I, I find very interesting is, uh, I, I have to say this, and I feel a little bit kind of discouraged in a sense just because of uh, your eminence, but it is that you you do on occasion talk about uh, philosophy, and I understand your criticisms, the criticisms of it. But I think that in a way, it is very uh, natural to understand why they didn't think about it, that many of them, like for example Thales, who this is beginning the tradition of empiricism, uh, at least the preliminary idea of the scientific method over 2,600 years ago, approximately. And I mean, I, and I, I just think that science has more or less seemingly become an evolution out of a lot of the critical thinking 
that has gone on. And you've expressed somewhat a, a, a bewilderment of how we haven't been able to figure this out previously. It, it is my wonder if it's kind of in, in the same sense very obvious why it might have eluded us, which is, I think, and I'm wondering, especially with a lot of uh, the politics that have been going on, I think, that demonstrate this, that we have an unfortunate tendency to overlook that, in many cases, del human delusion in uh, large quadrants of the populace seems to have somewhat helped the prevalence in the short term of the species. And I just, I'm wondering from both of you, if you think that perhaps it, we, there is just such an ingrained dogma and ritual that has given at least some functional benefit that we, we don't want to challenge that in, in some senses because that would, it would cause maybe some discord or some immediate nihilism over the, the emotional... I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not getting your question. <laughs> <laughs> That's because there isn't a question. <laughs> my, my question is more so that don't you think that philosophy has contributed a lot to the progression of the scientific method and to critical thinking and reading? I, I, I have I've no wish to say that to, to criticize philosophy in general. I was making a particular point that I was puzzled about why this very simple problem, which could have been solved from an armchair, was never solved from an armchair, it was only solved. Well, and, and Exagoras did uh, at least suggest that we might have come from okay. fish. Now, in, 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 wait, wait, so we can't have any follow-ups, but I think, of, was that the gist of the, of the, of the question? But, yeah, I mean, I... But I, I, do, I do value philosophy in other, in other respects. I, I mean, I, I, I have certain right. philosophers that I value very much, like um, Dan Dennett, like Correct. Hans Glover, like Peter Singer. Um, so I do, I do value the philosophy, but I just made that one point. Yeah. Battery just nose died. Uh, thank you for your work. I love the greatest show on earth. Uh, Josh said a lot of your books are infectious, uh, but it seems in our culture it's very difficult to get a regular person to read a freaking book. <laughs> so my question is, uh, could you? It has had a bit of a negative effect on our understanding of evolution, and if uh, you think that maybe. Uh, uh, if we didn't have such a need to classify and to name things, if that would make the understanding of the genetic variability and that and natural yes. selection as a more uh, present process, that's very understanding interesting. come more naturally. And if for teaching mechanisms, if we could teach maybe a little less taxonomy and a little more genetic variability beyond Mendelian genetics. That's an excellent point, which I haven't really thought of. Um, I, I think I, I see what we are you know, driving, that the, the ta taxonomy forces us to to label animals as this species or that species. So it's really coming back to the point I was making earlier, which was that earlier question. Um, and that tends to rather re remove the idea that species change into <coughs> other species, and maybe even another aspect of the essentialism point that Ernst Mayer made about why e evolution was so long coming to the 19th century, because of the idea that it was difficult for one species, but it wasn't inconceivable to think of one species changing into another. So thank you, yes. Uh, professor, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I'll keep my question very brief. Um, I think the secular movement has been a wonderful force for fighting the delusional nonsense and pseudoscience behind religion and intelligent design. When will we be as militant in fighting the delusional nonsense behind current climate change denial? Yes, well, um, the um, NCSS, the National Center for NCSE, National Center for Science Education, which was founded by Eugenie Scott in Oakland, California, and has magnificent work. Um, for the first sort of couple of decades of its existence, concentrated on evolution, and has recently switched its emphasis, still continues with evolution, switched its emphasis to climate change denial. What this organization does, and I strongly recommend following it is it acts as a kind of watchdog um, and firefighter for um, outbreaks of nonsense in any state in the United States and tries to deal, deal with it. Um, and so 
Um, I, I think my, my answer to you really is, is that the NCSE is, is a leading organization in, in this field. And it's probably something which um, CFI and the Richard Dawkins Foundation ought to be looking into as well. Thank you. Um, because we are running short on time, what we'll do, I'm sorry to everyone who's waiting, let's do two and two, and that'll push a little bit over time anyway, but if you're not one of the first two people on either, on either side, I'm afraid we're not going to do you. Um, I feel very special. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of talk today about politics and crazy selection, uh, specifically on the right side of the aisle. Um, and that's certainly crazy, but there's also a crazy phenomenon happening on the left, especially in our college campuses. Um, you've mentioned it a little bit uh, earlier today, the political correctness, but uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts as to why that's occurring on colleges, on college campuses, this political correctness, SJW, safe spaces phenomenon. Yes, I, I was uh, on the faculty in Berkeley uh, in the late 1960s, which was shortly after the free speech movement. So Ber Berkeley was the home of the free speech movement on campuses. And Berkeley now is betraying the free speech movement by denying a voice to people because they are likely to give offence to people on campus. <coughs> the moment somebody like Ayon Hersi Ali is invited to give a speech, the Islamic society in the university, I don't know, that this happened in Brandeis, for example, will complain, and immediately their complaint is upheld and she gets disinvited. This pathetic eagerness not to offend any, particularly not to offend Muslims, but not to offend anybody, and thus you get these ridiculous so-called safe spaces. <laughs> Play-Doh. <laughs> Puppies and kittens to play with in case, of, in case of... What on earth is a university for other than to be challenged, other than to be invited to think for yourself? first realized and was able to comprehend that there was no first human um, because I was raised in a very strict religious uh, Baptist background. Anyway, um, but I often find myself wondering when there may have been a first religion. Say our ancestors at whatever stage may have been sitting around in some cave and one guy looked over at the other and said, you know, give me your uh, your mammoth meat and your wife, because I, stung, I talked to this sky guy out here the other day, and, and, and he said that you should do so or you're going to a very bad place. And, and I, I think about that moment, and then I think, I, I wonder why it grew. And in, in your opinion, do you think it continued due to the fact that it, it allowed one man to have power over others, or did it or did it continue based upon the fact that people fear death and they want to they want to feel good about there being something afterwards? I think it could be both of those, um, and I think it also could be if you look around um, uh, primitive tribal religions, you'll very often find that there, that there are gods invented for all sorts of things. There's the, there's the sun god, the sky god, the, the river god, the sea god, um, the waterfall god. And I think there's a natural tendency to impute agency to natural phenomena. And that this might have actual value. Um, much of what goes on in the world has nothing to do with agency, has nothing to do with living things, doing anything. It's just the wind or the waves or it's just the river or, or just thing, things happen under the laws of physics. But you're probably better off if you assume that the analogies we used to the rustling in the long grass. It could be the wind or it could be a leopard. And although it's statistically unlikely to be a leopard, it's a bigger risk if it is. And so you're better off assuming that it is a leopard. And similarly, um, this idea of this, this tendency to see agency where there is none shows itself in, in the river god and the waterfall god and the, and the sun god and things like that. So that's, that's one thing. Then there's the 
um, using religion, for your dominant um, tribal chiefs and things, using the religion as a means of controlling, and nowadays there's archbishops and popes and things using religion as a means of controlling people. That, that, is, that is another strand. Um, then you also uh, mentioned fear of death and wishful thinking. Um, I feel so alive, I feel I'm here, I feel like I can't believe I'm just going to be snuffed out when I, when I die. There must be an afterlife, that kind of thing. Um, and all these things, I think, um, are reinforced mightily by the tendency I mentioned earlier for children to, to believe what their elders tell them. So whatever, for whatever those reasons, um, your parents come to believe something. If they pass it on to you as a child, then you believe it for very good Darwinian reasons. There are plenty of good Darwinian reasons why children should believe their parents, because parents will often give good advice on how to survive. And it's not possible for the child brain to know whether the advice that's being given really is good, or whether it's silly advice, really, I mean, religious advice. Um, and so it, it is a bad advice, like you have to pray to the sun god every day or, that, or, or, or something terrible will happen. That advice gets passed down to the generations as, as well. So I think there are lots and lots of reasons why religions get going and why they, get, why they persist. Let's keep these last two nice and quick. Um, for the sake of brevity, I'll skip the background. However, I was wondering, uh, it occurs to me that intellectualism and enlightened thought sort of pools and ebbs across the globe in time. And um, I'm wondering, in your travels and in your experience, if you've considered where the next pooling of progressive thought may occur, something in 10 or 20 years or something, you say, hey, there's a lot of people here that seem to be headed in the right direction. Where do you think we might have the next enlightenment in, in our generation? I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> I wish I knew. I'm not really sure I quite understood the question, but, I, but I, I'm pretty sure I don't have the answer anyway. <laughs> Is the question what, what parts of the world are ripe for an Enlightenment revolution? I mean, one might speculate about parts of Asia, right? One might speculate about China or... I don't know. Uh, maybe, you yes. You didn't ask me, so I don't know whether you care what I I mean, I, I'm inclined to think that, 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 in, that in enlightenment nowadays more or less means science. And so, um, those parts of the world which practice science and, and foster science and fund science are likely to be such, are likely to be such places. So, I mean, the United States is, is, is the leading scientific nation and, and manages to hold on to that position despite being dragged backwards by the benighted half of the country which we have seen recently. Yeah, the problem here is that we've already been exposed to all of them. We, we know what we're missing, so anyone who is still refusing to get the memo about science is doing so willfully, whereas there are parts of the world where sure. you can imagine that they're only superstitious because they don't know any better and they could be right for change. Last question, go for it. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, you mentioned the name of Peter Singer, and I believe you interviewed him at one point. And you seem to more or less admit to him that you ate meat. Um, and I was wondering how your thinking has evolved on that since then, if it has at all. I think that suffering should be reduced for all beings capable of, uh, of, of suffering. Uh, I, I follow Jeremy Bentham, who, who said the question is not, um, can they think, can they reason, can they suffer? And um, it, it's fairly common for people to assume that uh, the human species is morally special in this respect because we are intelligent. And that, is ten that tends to elide into a view that because we're intelligent, we're therefore more capable of suffering pain. If you think about what pain is actually for in a Darwinian sense, it's a warning, don't do that again. That's what pain's about. Uh, if you do something which causes pain, that's a signal that if you do it again, you might actually injure yourself, it might, it might kill you. That's why it's a Darwinian big bad thing. So you have to ask the question, is there any reason why an intelligent species should be more capable of feeling pain, given that pain is, is a warning to stop the animal doing something bad? something bad for itself. I see no reason why there should be. Um, there's no reason to think that because we're intelligent, we're more capable of feeling pain than, say, a cow or a pig. You might even argue the reverse. I'm not sure that Peter Singer's ever done this, but I'm going to put it 
forward. Um, the more intelligent a species is, you might argue, the less pain it needs in order to be deterred from um, doing what is just done. So I, um, I think that we should work hard to avoid inflicting pain on sentient beings, other animal species. Um, eating meat is something which I do and try to give it up. Um, I think the important thing is to avoid suffering and what I'm absolutely I'm not confident of is that, is that animals are spared suffering in farms and in slaughterhouses. I believe they do suffer in farms and slaughterhouses and I think that needs to be um, tightened up by, by law. Um, killing painlessly Killing painlessly is easier to justify. It may not be totally easy to justify, but it's easier to, to, to justify. So I, I would like to see um, methods of farming uh, made much more humane. That's going to make meat much more expensive, but I think that would be a good thing. Um, one of the problems at present is that the drive towards making food cheap means that animals are kept in factory mass-produced conditions, which uh, it's very hard to believe do not cause suffering. Uh, and so I, I, I think that, the, 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 as a start at least, the price we should pay for reducing suffering is a much higher price for meat and a gradual weaning off meat altogether, perhaps, towards complete vegetarianism. Please do make sure that you donate if possible to the Centre for Inquiry and Richard Dawkins Foundation. Listen to our podcasts. I co-host Point of Inquiry, which is a terrific one-on-one -on -one conversation with interesting people. Um, Richard has been a guest of, of, on the show. You can find that on all good podcast platforms. I have another podcast called We The People Live. Just follow me on Twitter or something and get into this universe. I think that after this work week in particular, we need all the help we can get to promote secularism, science, reason, and rationality in this country and around the world. Let's um, now do some book signings. Uh, just in order to get through people as quickly as possible, um, we do request that you don't ask Richard to sign a name or a message. We ask that you don't ask him for a selfie. You'll have to take photo of him after whatever. Um, but what we're going to do if you want to leave, then leave now. <laughs> <laughs>